You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, everybody listening, and welcome to the Common Descent Podcast. This is a podcast about paleontology, evolution, the history of life on Earth. This is episode 183. Our topic this episode is feathers. Feathers. This is good. This is a this is a fun topic to get to do an episode about because we have talked about feathers a bunch. Yeah, they've come up a number of times. Over the history of the podcast, they have come up in various episodes. We've talked about them in our very many bird episodes, various dinosaur episodes. They come up in the news pretty regularly. Yep. But we've never actually taken a whole episode to just do a full discussion of what are feathers, what are how, what is the diversity of feathers, the structure of feathers, the functions of feathers. We're going to do a grand introduction. Well, it's going to be a, a flyby, as often <laughs> these things are, so to speak, to what are feathers, how we understand the evolution of feathers, and we'll get to talk all in one episode about feathers in the fossil record and what ancient animals have feathers and what types of feathers they have. This is going to be a really fun uh, episode. I'm very excited to talk about feathers. Yeah, I'm ready. This is also fun because we've talked about feathers and feather evolution and fossil feathers a bunch in previous episodes, but the podcast has been going on long enough now that there's new information yes. ready to go in this episode. <laughs> so updates from some of our previous discussions. Also, as all of our topics are, this topic was requested. Feathers, as a episode discussion topic, was requested by the following podcast listeners. Jilly, Serpentine, Science Skink, Dr. Jazz, Jessica, Lydia, Scott, Robert, and someone on one of our Q&As who identified themselves as longtime listener, first-time caller. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for the request. Uh, stay tuned to enjoy the topic of th that you requested us to talk about. Yes. Before we get into the science-y stuff, some announcements. Uh, right first, foremost, most important thing to say, uh, we have a Patreon. We do. The support that we receive from our patrons helps the podcast continue to run. Not only the moral and emotional support, which is very, very nice, but also financial support, which lets us pay for all the things that we have to pay for and continue our science education efforts, especially to continue to provide them at will to the Internet. Yes. Members on our Patreon get access to all sorts of goodies, bonus content, director's notes. We do monthly live streams that our patrons can join. We recently added some new upper tiers with extra super cool goodies, including some exclusive t-shirts that uh, recently finally became available, and we've been sending them out to some of our listeners. Yeah. One of the goodies that patrons at certain tiers can get is a shout out right here at the top of the podcast. This episode, we would like to shout out and welcome Brett, Eric, Quinn, Liv, Travis, and Simon. Welcome. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we hope you enjoy. Speaking of ways that you can support us and get in contact with us, we have a physical mailing address. Mm -hmm. Every now and then, people like to send us physical goodies. And very recently, we received a very special gift sent to us by Danielle, which is some mounted insects. Yeah, a couple of cicadas, a damselfly, a dragonfly. Yeah, some really lovely bugs. They're, they are now uh, mounted. The, the whole the little box is mounted on our wall along with a lot of our other cards and things that we've gotten from people in the past. Very cool. Especially cool to see these particular bugs since we recently did a mm -hmm. Dragonflies episode and a Cicadas mini episode. Yes. Uh, so that it's a really cool supplement for us to get to see those bugs. Yeah. So thank you so much, Danielle. That's really great. That was really cool to, to open up and see. Dear listeners, uh, if you want to send us some sort of physical goodies, uh, you can find our physical mailing address on our website via links in the episode description. One more thing. It is now 2024. Yes, indeed. Uh, this isn't the first episode of 2024 because we recorded that we already put one out. But this is the first one we're recording in 2024. Very true. For us, which means we are coming up on... 
another anniversary of the podcast. At the end of January, we will be celebrating the seven-year anniversary of the Common Descent podcast. We will be celebrating with our traditional annual live stream. Mm -hmm. This is a live stream that will be open to anybody to join. It will be hosted on YouTube. We will start posting the link and information all over the place. It will be on January 28th. That's a Sunday, January 28th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. We'll be live for anybody to join. We will talk about some upcoming things for this year. We will choose and announce the winners of our Patreon giveaway, where we will be giving away special goodies to people who are subscribed to us on Patreon. And uh, we'll just do a Q&A for as long as we spend there and people want to ask us questions and say stuff to us in the chat. Our live streams are a lovely way for us to interact with our audience. And uh, we get to do a couple special things to celebrate yet another year that the podcast has managed to survive. <laughs> I'm excited for it. Uh, live streams and, and getting to talk with the listeners is always tons of fun. So if you can, please join us for that. Again, January 28th, 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Check our social medias and everywhere else for that for that information and link. That's enough announcing new things. So let us move on to uh, announcing new things. Yes. In our first major section, the news. Every episode, we like to start off by talking about some recent research news from the fields of paleontology, evolution, the kinds of things we're all excited about. Will, what news have you brought for the class today? I have some news about bird neck bones. All right. Hey, birds, that's a related thing yeah. to the episode. Thought it was fitting. Uh, these are slightly odd for bird neck bones uh, and might have some, might suggest some interesting adaptations. This is research by General Mayer et al. in the Journal of Anatomy, and the article is a press release in phys.org by the Sinkenberg Research Institute and the Natural History Museum. So this is research on four new bird neck bones that were found from the Quercy fissure fillings in France. This is a famous site for Eocene fossils. Yes, indeed. And indeed, these date to two of the vertebrae were able to be dated to the late Eocene, 37 million years ago. Uh, the others lacked clear stratigraphic data, so they couldn't quite pin down what layer they were from. These are notable because they have unusual features, particularly tubercles basically little bony bumps on the neck bones okay so they're just kind of knobbly kind of warty is sure if, if you're trying to picture it they have these little bumps these little tubercles on all four of those neck bones and these are not the only neck bone bird neck bones like these from the eocene from similar sites there are others from germany messel pit that are date to about 48 million years old and the London clay formation, about 53 million years old. Now, those were all flattened. These four new ones are 3D. Oh, so they're preserved in nice three dimensions and we can see more detail. So this is the first time we've been able to get a really good look at that surface texture and potentially figure out what's going on with it. All right, tell us about these tubercles. This feature is super weird because it is not known from any modern bird. There's no modern bird that has this kind of texturing on their neck bones. And so what it is has remained a mystery and even been thought it might be a pathological. It might be a disease of some sort. Yeah. Uh, that something went wrong with the growth of these bones. They did note whilst looking into this feature that similar structure, similar texture has been found on the skull of the African maned rat, which is alive today. Okay, but it's a rat. It's a rat. Which, but, is, which is not a bird. But basically, that's the only thing they mentioned as a similar Got texturing <laughs> of bone. <laughs> right, so similar, but not, not quite related. close. Yep. <laughs> uh, but m maybe a similar thing is going on. All so right. we have maybe, they have an example to hold off to the side and come back to. But it does indicate that similar structures might be normal. So this might not be pathological. We have one that is not pathological, just not a bird. And on a different part of the body. So they microcomputed tomography, which they scanned it yeah. for very fine detail. Micro CT scanning. And it got high resolution images of these four new ones that are 3D and found some interesting internal structures as well. The tubercles do seem to be associated with os osteosclerosis, which is the 
abnormal, you know, the unusual hardening and growth of bone density. The outer layer, the cortex of the vertebrae is unusually thick. So it's not just bumps on the surface. Right. There is stuff going on deeper in. And they had fewer pneumatic spaces. So those hollow areas compared to most modern birds, uh, with the exception of specialized diving birds. Yeah, I was just going to say thickened bone and lessened hollow spaces is something we see often in aquatic vertebrates. Yes, yes. So they are unusual vertebrae, not just on the surface, but inside. So something unusual does seem to be going on other than just these bumps. This all led them to conclude that these are true features, not pathological. Part of the reason they came to that conclusion as well was the fact that they were these bumps were absent from functionally critical parts of the vertebrae, where the vertebrae would be meeting each other. There were no growths on the articular the articulation surfaces. Right. If it was a disease, you'd expect that it wouldn't it wouldn't mind getting in the way of important functions. Yeah, exactly. It would it would not be discerning of where it showed up. Right. The, these seem like they are developing in out of the way areas. Yeah, specific spots. <laughs> mm-hmm. So this seems to be a characteristic of these Eocene birds. All these birds came from a group called the the Perplexi Cervicidae. Which sounds like it means confusing necks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they came to the conclusion, or at least proposed, that these very likely or at least could serve as a strengthening element for the neck bones. Mm-hmm. That we might be seeing features for what they called armoring the neck with this denser bone and these bumpy areas that could likely be an anti-predator adaptation, especially since a lot of the thickening and strengthening was around the sheaths, the coverings of the arteries, nerves, and spinal cord. Okay. So areas that would be crushed if bitten which is a very common strategy for many mammalian predators that go for a neck bite. They noted also that this could mean that the main rat is also using a similar defense, but for the back of its skull. Yeah. That we might be seeing similar adaptations between the two. Thus far, though, these tubercles are only known from these Eocene birds from Central Europe, which is an area and time where it seems like birds were probably under relatively low predation pressure pressures because many birds from that area and that time are flightless Mm -hmm. and so we're spending a lot more time on ground so it doesn't seem like this was a high predator area in time and it's potential that these birds also lived on the ground but i don't know that they have enough to confirm that but they did share the area with carnivorous mammals at least some of which whose modern relatives use neck bites as their killing mode of of uh, their technique and that these strengthening ne- strengthened necks would mitigate attacks from smaller predators with weak bite forces. Mm-hmm. So it may not be a response to high predation, but the predators they had. Yeah. Which is, I found kind of an interesting uh, set of uh, scenarios. But if all this is correct, it would be the first known example of internal bony armor in birds. That's really interesting. It does make me... Uh wonder and speculate about the various reasons why a bird might benefit from an armored neck. Yep. Uh, Protection from predators certainly makes sense. I would wonder if they had some sort of unusual foraging strategy. Yeah. Like diving birds who, like gannets and stuff that plunge dive, often have strengthened skulls and necks Mm -hmm. because they are putting a lot of strain on it. I wonder if these birds were doing something unusual or were they giraffe neck fighting yeah. with each other and slamming their necks into each other? That was the, the thought I had is maybe you had some form of competition or, or courtship, courtship thing. that required your necks to be strengthened. Uh, they also did note that just birds have long and very easily targeted necks. Oh, they sure do. So... It, it, that is <laughs> an area. If you're going to armor something. <laughs> that if you're going to put defense somewhere, that would be a good spot for yeah. it. Yeah. And if, if they were flightless or flying less, adding that extra thickening, potentially adding some weight, potentially compromising some of the respiratory mm-hmm. functions there by reducing those hollow spaces might not be as severe a problem as it might be if it was a flying bird. Yes, yes. Interesting. Well, yeah. that's pretty cool. Well, my first bit of news is about giant predatory worms. Gross. 
they're pretty cool. They're pretty cool <laughs> worms. Uh, this is research in science advances by Taeyoon Park et al. And the article we'll be referring to, which will be linked in the blog post associated with this episode on our website, that article is in Interesting Engineering by Murgakshi Dixit. These are fossils of large predatory invertebrates from the early Cambrian. So we're going way back to some of the earliest marine ecosystems of animals on Earth. The Cambrian, of course, is a very interesting time period because we see a lot of early members of popular groups today. We see a lot of unusual early ecosystem features. And there's been lots of research interested in figuring out what was eating what, what were the modes of feeding, what did the food web look like, and, because it this also makes headlines and is interesting, who were the top predators? Who yes. were the most important predators at that time? Famous Cambrian predators tend to include arthropods like Anomalocaris and other animals like that. This research describes a new species that belongs to a group called Catognaths. This is a group that is still around today. They are also called arrow worms. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Arrow worms today are small ocean predators. They tend to be just a few centimeters long. They're not like wriggly earthwormy worms. Uh, at least the images that I saw of them are a, a bit shorter and straighter mm -hmm. while still being quite narrow. Usually they're just a few centimeters long. The largest ones, uh, it seems, are up to 10 or 12 centimeters long. All right, not bad. This is pretty good for little worms. Yes. They tend to eat zooplankton, so tiny animals floating in the water. One of the things that's notable about modern day arrowworms is that they have heads covered in these hooked spines that they use to grab food, and it makes them look quite terrifying. <laughs> this new fossil appears to be either in this group, or at the very least an early cousin of the arrowworms, discovered from a fossil site uh, called Sirius Passet in North Greenland, so way up north. These date to the early Cambrian, about 518 million years ago. The fossil preservation here is exceptional, including most of the body, with soft tissues showing some of the external and internal features. The researchers uh, identified this as a new genus and species, Timorabestia coprii. Uh, if I, I didn't write it down here, but Timorabestia, I think, means terrible beast or something, something to that effect. Nice. The actual, so again, not shaped like a long squiggly worm. The images, to me, the overall shape of this creature looks like this like the sole inset of a shoe yes but it's sort of flat and broad and not particularly long which is also not an uncommon shape for many marine worms no. and it's also similar to like nudibranchs yes. the sea slugs things like that it looks kind of like that general shape the main standout feature of this ancient arrowworm is its size like I said, modern day arrowworms tend to be a few centimeters long up to perhaps 12 centimeters. The largest specimen reported here is 30 centimeters long. Wow. So a foot long. So literally the insole of a shoe. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it's actually a foot long, which not only is that quite large compared to their modern day cousins, for the early Cambrian, that's, that's huge. That's big. That, this was one of the largest organisms that there were yeah. in the world at this time. A foot long is enormous. A, oh, big foot long, flat. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> it has a distinct head with long antennae, internal jaws, not the hooks and spines on the outside like Ooh. modern ones. Also fins around the outline of the body. So lateral fins and a quote tail fin, fins towards the back that would have been used for swimming. Internal structures preserved were identified as remains of muscles, a digestive system, parts of the nervous system, including a structure called the ventral ganglion, which is a cluster of nerves distinct to the arrowworm lineage, which is one of the key features that allowed them to identify this as belonging to that lineage. Makes sense. And, of course, as you would hope when analyzing and describing the remains of a giant predator— there were gut contents. <laughs> Inside the guts, they found the remains of arthropods called isoxus. These were very common arthropods at this site. They are swimming arthropods, and they are covered in spines, 
there's a wonderful quote, I think, in the press release or in the article of one of the authors describing these little arthropods are covered in spines that are meant to protect them, but it clearly didn't do a, a great job in this particular case. The size of the overall worm and these gut contents suggest that this new genus and species were likely a important predator of these early Cambrian seas. The authors even point out that these could be hints of an earlier ecosystem of major predators before some of those important arthropod predators showed up a little later on. So before Anomalocaris and other arthropods became the major groups of predators in the Cambrian, there may have been a time period where it was things like these worms. Yes, yes. Were filling that niche. Very cool. It's it's always fun to get a glimpse into the, the ecosystem of that time because everything's so alien. And it doesn't get much more alien than a free swimming giant worm that gobbles a- up apex predator spiny worm arthropods yep. <laughs> like that's pretty awesome very and it's it's an interesting concept because i don't know that there are many free swimming predatory worms today uh which doesn't surprise me because there's so many free swimming things that would eat a free swimming worm sure sure but most predatory worms i'm aware of are like burrowers and yeah in the sediment yeah and the one and the free swimming ones tend to be quite small. Yes, and like the the ones that I I tend to see that swim it's to get places or to spawn or to get away. Right. So it would be I'd I'd interested to learn is is that a a niche that we don't really have room for anymore? Right. It, it, Were are, they around when they could be? Yes, <laughs> and they can't be. Modern more. ecosystems cannot sustain a giant free swimming predatory worm. Because there's too many other things. Yeah. Anomalocarids moved in and those worms had to go away. Yes. You know, something like that. Very cool. Well, speaking of very early Earth history and important bits of evolution, evolutionary time, this next research is potentially describing our currently oldest evidence of photosynthesis. This is research by Catherine DeMolin et al. in Nature. And the article we'll be linking to is by Jacqueline Kwan in Live Science. So one of the big things that this research is dealing with is the appearance of oxygen on our planet and its origins. We talked about the great oxidation event in, here on the podcast before. Absolutely. Episode 75. This was an event about 2.45 billion years ago. A long time. Very long time ago. When the levels of O2 in our atmosphere skyrocketed Mm -hmm. they started building up much more notably notably than they had before this had huge effects on the planet the chemistry of how things weathered the biochemistry that was now able to be maintained by life on our earth yeah life mineral like the kinds of things that could form Mm -hmm. changed and you can now also have ones creatures that were using oxygen to breathe Mm -hmm. in a way they couldn't before so Huge component of Earth's evolution, the triggering events for that have been debated because many hold that that was likely when photosynthesis became a major survival strategy and function and aspect of life on our planet. Right. We talked about it in that episode Mm -hmm. that there has been discussion about was that triggered by a sudden rise in photosynthesizers? Or were they already there and then something else, some geologic thing changed that somehow allowed for that shift to happen? Exactly. So understanding the evolution of photosynthesis and when that timing does or does not sync up with this oxidation event would give us some insights into at least what kind of role it was playing or how much of a role. So this means looking at photosynthesizers. Today... Photosynth- the main photosynthesizers on our planet are cyanobacteria, and as they put it, which I love this, they're plastid relatives within eukaryotes. The organelles within plant cells. <laughs> that- Chloroplasts. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so cyanobacteria and the things that used to be cyanobacteria. Yes, which today are parts of plants. Yes. Algae, land plants, etc. Cyanobacteria are... Very diverse. They're the oldest life form that we're aware of that probably showed up on Earth first and is 
likely to be the first ones that were doing photosynthesis when it started. So understanding their diversification is probably where we need to look to answer those other questions. But their fossil record is not great when you go all the way back because it's very old. They're very small. <laughs> so we don't have a clear map of how they evolve photosynthesis. Yeah, they don't even have bones. Not even. The main thing that they want to try to identify within the evolution of cyanobacteria is when the thylakoid-less cyanobacterias split from the ones that develop thylakoids, and thylakoids are the flattened sacs within chloroplasts that hold the pigments that allow photosynthesis to happen. Okay. So at some point, some cyanobacteria developed these thylakoid membranes, and those would have been our first photosynthesizers. There are cyanobacteria around still today that do not have those. So mm. some point there was a split between those groups. That divergence has been estimated to be between 2 to 2.7 billion years old, somewhere in between that, based on molecular clocks and the relationships of cyanobacteria. This research is discussing some new cyanobacteria fossils that seem like they might help us with these dates, at least a little bit. At least two different fossil examples. I saw the news article mentioned a third, but I didn't see any discussion on okay. the third, so I don't know if they didn't find evidence of cyanobacteria or at least not pertinent to this research. But two samples from Australia and Canada have cyanobacteria in them. This is a mud clay that was compacted into rock. Uh, it described parallel to contorted arrangements in the Australian clay, and they named a species, uh, uh, they noted a species, Navifusa mengensis. This is from the McDermott Formation in Australia, which dates to 1.78 to 1.73 billion years old. And the Canadian Formation, which was partial arrangements of specimens. So not, it sounds like not as clear as the Australian ones, but still there, are from the Grassy Bay Formation, which is 1.01 to 0.9 billion years old. They used electron microscopy, and electron mi microscopes use electrons instead of light particles to visualize things that we can't see with visible light. So they got a very detailed look at these fossils and detected thylakoid membranes, which makes it the earliest evidence of thylakoid membranes, the earliest evidence of photosynthetic capable yeah, organisms. Photosynthesizing structures yes. directly. And so these are now our oldest confirmed fossils and evidence for photosynthesis happening, pushing the date back, pushing the evidence back 1.2 billion years <laughs> from where we had had it before, and provides a minimum age for that divergence that had to have happened at least by 1.75 billion years ago, which they said fit well within current theories of the evolution of the, these photosynthesizing cyanobacteria. So this date is at least corroborating previous hypotheses. And they also know that this has shown a new tool for identifying this and could be used to decide to reanalyze other and potentially older existing fossils that might give us even older evidence and confirmation of dates. So we now have a new way to go about it. Well, that's very exciting. We've talked about here and there, those events in early stages of the evolution of life as we know it on Earth, and how difficult it is to study things like the evolution of photosynthesis. So getting per fossils preserved well enough that we can potentially identify the structures that the cells were using, very handy. Mm -hmm. Well, and they noted that this demonstrates the importance of looking at the, as they called them, ultrastructures of fossil cells. Which makes it sound like this has not been a technique used in a lot of previous studies of hmm. early, early cyanobacteria fossils. Right. So maybe it's we, the, they have to go through some previously reported fossils exactly. and see, can we find similar evidences in those? Yep. Yep. Look for the actual cell structures and not just chemical evidence. Yeah. Well, very cool. Well, my last bit of news is also about an unusual preservation of structures 
older than they have been preserved before. Although this uh, next one is a little bit closer to our uh, topic of discussion of this episode that we will be getting to. How many billion years old is it? This is uh, (laughs) 0.3 billion years old. This research uh, describes what is now the oldest known fossilized skin impressions, which is very, very cool. This is research by Ethan Mooney et al. in Current Biology, and the article we will link in the blog post is on Smithsonian Magazine, written by Riley Black. The fossil site that these fossils came from is called Richard Spur in Oklahoma. These date to the early Permian between 289 and 286 million years ago, so just under 300 million years old. This site preserves a rich assemblage of early tetrapods, including some of the oldest known amniotes. Tetrapods are land-dwelling vertebrates descended from fish. Amniotes are the group that includes reptiles, birds, and mammals, our hard egg-laying creatures. The site is also noted because, like uh, a lot of our news this episode, it preserves fossils in extraordinary condition, including with soft tissues. The site itself is, uh, like the one you were describing from France, are cave fissures that were filled in with clay. In this case, the fissures were filled in with fine clay, which is good for preserving things in detail. And then those clays were infiltrated by oil seeps from other older marine sediments. And they describe that what probably happened here is that as the oil seeped in and combined with the clay, it formed... Uh, uh, sort of a seal that would have helped to protect these fossils. Okay. Would have created an even better environment for preserving really good tissues in these fossils. A a barrier. Yeah. That's interesting. They describe multiple specimens of bits and pieces of preserved skin from early amniotes, probably early reptiles or close cousins of early reptiles. Several of these are fragments of skin compression fossils. So the sort of carbonized impression of skin within the sediment. And one example of a three-dimensionally preserved cast of bits of skin on an early reptile called Captorhinus. Whoa. Actually on the skeleton, a patch of skin behind the skull in the sort of the neck region that is arranged in 24 bands with texture on them that they were able to examine. They were able to look at the external texture based on just the structure of the fossils and CT scans to get a sense of the internal structure of the 3D preserved bits of skin. These are the first ever known skin fossils from the Paleozoic era. According to the article, these beat the previous record by 130 million years. So this is a, it's going to be a while, perhaps, before this gets broken again. (laughs) The skin on these early reptile cousins, they described as, in certain ways, quite similar to modern reptiles. They specifically compared it multiple times to crocodilians. Okay. On the outside, the skin appears to have been covered in pebbly scales, Mm -hmm, mm non-overlapping. So a lot of lizards and snakes have overlapping scales. Yeah, they're kind of shingled. Yeah, exactly. Whereas if you think of the scales on the limbs of gators or tortoises, sort of pebbles that aren't necessarily on top of each other. The internal structure showed that the skin was relatively thick. And they also described that the internal structures of the skin seem to be well suited for side to side movement. Okay. The way that lizards walk, the way we'd expect these reptiles to be walking. All of this is exciting because number one, Uh, Oldest skin, very cool. Number two, we know what the outside of early Permian reptiles looked like, which is extraordinary. But also, these are some of the earliest amniotes, and amniotes are famous for having made the drastic transition away from the water and became well adapted to more terrestrial environments. Yeah, not just with their eggshell, but with their body. Yeah, and changes to the skin were probably very important for that. Thicker skin, scaly skin would have been very helpful for protecting against the elements, for protecting against drying out on land, stuff like that. 
So this also gives us an unprecedented clue as to what the skin looked like in these animals early on in the history of amniotes. And it looks like it already looked very much like the type of skins we see on reptiles today. Which is a very cool example of like, that's what had been predicted was that yes. likely when we we would see scales starting to show up in those first amniotes as they were moving from the water, but we did not have their skin. Mm -hmm. It made sense based off the skeletons and based off who they seemed to be related to, but we didn't actually have their skin to confirm that until now where, yeah, no, they seem to be scaly to move yes. away from the water. Very cool. This is also another one of those studies, uh, kind of like what we were just talking about with the photosynthesis one, where I don't, far be it for me to demand anything of any other busy <laughs> paleontologist, but please keep looking in that fossil site. Yes. <laughs> keep, keep going there. Uh, who knows what other exciting things are preserved within there. Uh, very cool to know. Awesome. Also, I want to see updated paleo art. Yeah, there is a there's a a piece of art associated with the article, but I don't I didn't see if it was a new piece mm -hmm. of art. I mm -hmm. don't know if it was if it's art that came with this paper or if it's an old depiction. It didn't immediately strike me as looking pebbly. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I don't know if it's a new one or if I just didn't look at it close enough. Yes. So, uh, perhaps uh, maybe this will be uh, inspiration for a bunch of paleo artists. Cool. Well, hey, speaking of integument, the things that develop on the outside of the bodies of animals. Uh, what a lovely uh, transition for us to talk about our main topic of discussion. Something significantly more rare and specialized and complex than some simple pebbly scales. This episode, we're going to talk about feathers. After the break, we're going to start off this discussion by a way that I love to start off discussions on the podcast by asking an extremely simple question that will take us half an hour to answer. Uh, the question is, what are feathers? <laughs> Stay tuned for that. So we begin our discussion with the question, what are feathers? This is a complicated question. To my mind, the simplest and most effective starting answer to this question is feathers are the things that birds are covered with. Yes. That's what feathers are bird coats. Mm -hmm. They are a form of integument. They grow out of the skin like hair, like scales, and they are distinct to birds among modern day animals. Only birds have feathers. Yes. Only birds have anything like feathers. Yeah. Feathers yeah. are a very unique and unusual type of integument that only birds have. Later, we will talk about the fossil record and we will learn that it is not only birds and some of their dinosaur cousins are known to have feathers. But today, feathers are the bird thing. Feathers are also key to the most famous thing that birds do, mm -hmm. which is flying. Unlike other flying animals, the integument of birds is an essential part. Without feathers, birds can't fly. The feathers make up their flight surface. Like hair, feathers protrude out of the skin. They develop in the skin and grow out of it. Also like hair, kind of, feathers are made of keratin. I'll put a little asterisk there. Because here's the thing I learned about keratin. Uh, so keratin, uh, you've heard us talk about keratin before. It is a sturdy type of protein that very famously is what makes up our fingernails, our hair, the fur of mammals, scales of reptiles. Uh, there's keratin throughout our skin. Mm -hmm. It is a very widespread protein. Classically, it was considered that there were two types of keratin, broadly speaking, which were called alpha keratin and beta keratin. You may have heard of this. Yep, yep. However... Apparently, according to what I have learned, research has shown that these two uh, supposed types of keratin are not related to each other. Oh. They are different types of proteins. So more recent studies that I've read have started calling alpha keratin just keratin and beta keratin corneous beta proteins. Oh, uh, okay. To distinguish them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is an important point of uh, discussion because quote alpha keratins keratin is found across 
vertebrates. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We have it. Birds have it. Rep, uh, other reptiles have it. But these beta carotene, these corneas beta proteins, are only found in reptiles, including birds. Oh. They have both, but this is the thing that feathers are mostly made of. This other form of protein. CBPs, as they are called, these beta proteins, are extremely tough and durable. Some have proposed that it is the structure of these proteins that allows feathers to do all the things that feathers do. Mm -hmm. Also, like our hair, feathers are dead tissue. Mm -hmm. The feather develops, but there's no blood vessels and nerves and stuff running through that feather it's just there doing its thing yeah it's produced from the skin but it is it's it's not constantly nourished and replenished this is part of why birds preen their feathers Uh, this is a very common and important habit among birds who go through and run through their feathers with their beaks they're cleaning them they're straightening them out they might pluck out feathers that have gotten uh all messed up. They also have preening glands that they'll spread secretions over the feathers, which helps keep them moist and flexible, which might also protect them from like bacteria and stuff. Feathers also molt. Mm -hmm. Feathers have a replenishing cycle where they will eventually fall out as a new feather grows in underneath them, like teeth. Yeah. Like the teeth of reptiles, feathers are con- are replaced by new feathers underneath them. Well, it's, thus far, it's all still fairly similar to a lot of things with mammal hair. Yeah, that we have we have to groom and mm-hmm. wash our hair. It can't heal itself or maintain itself. We have to do that. It will shed old hairs, and new hairs will come in those. It, where that follicle was, a new hair will come in once it falls out. Yes, we have oil in our skin to oil and maintain our hair and fur. Yes, feathers are very similar Mm -hmm. to fur in those regards. One of the main places where feathers differ from hair and fur is their structure. Feathers, I have seen them called in multiple papers that I read in preparation for this episode, the most complex outgrowths of vertebrate skin. They're a little bit fancier than a strand of hair. Hair is a single, for the most part, hair tends to be a single filament. Mm -hmm. It is a strand of hair. Not to diminish the complexity and importance of hair. Yeah, you get fancy, like polar bears have hollow hairs and you can get cool hairs. But it's a relatively simple, it's one one strand. Feathers get complicated. (laughs) The classic image of a feather, if I ask you to picture a feather in your head, odds are you are picturing what is known as a veined feather. Uh, These are kind of leaf-shaped. They have that sort of central pillar, and then there's the sort of smooth, flat surfaces off on either side. These are called vein feathers or pinaceous feathers. The structure here is a that long central shaft is called the rachis. At the base, it's hollow, sort of a hollow tube. It anchors into the skin, sits in a follicle inside the skin. On either side of that central rachis is a row of barbs, basically little branches, Mm -hmm. sticking off both sides. Each of those barbs has their own little branches called barbules, and each of those barbules has little hooklets on them. And because of those hooklets, each of those barbs basically velcros to the one next to it. Like zipper. They zip together to form that seemingly solid and flat side panel on the si- uh, uh, to the sides of the rachis, that panel is called a vein. Yeah. V-A-N-E, like a weather vein, hence veined feathers. Yeah, the, if you've ever gotten to play with a feather and you've broken that vein, yeah, you split can, you it. You can pull them apart. But then if you just kind of run your fingers back over it, it will zip back together. Yes. Those are those hooks grabbing back onto the other barb that it came unhooked from. Yes. So a vein feather, central rachis, barbs in a long row sticking off the side. Each of them has little barbule branches. Each of those has little hooklets. This is a this is what we're talking about when we say a complex structure. Yeah, well, it's, it's almost like a fractal where it's like, here's yes. one branch, <laughs> here's another branch, here's more branches. And here's more, <laughs> and they keep going. Uh, and these allow them to maintain that vein feather shape. Vein feathers, uh, typically on birds, come in three main varieties. There are feathers called remiges, which are flight feathers. Mm-hmm. These are often large, long feathers. 
that are anchored to the hands and the arms and form the shape of the wing. This it other flying vertebrates, pterosaurs and bats, the flying surface is made of skin. Yes. In birds, that flying surface is the feathers. If you take all the feathers off of a bird's arm, it's, it can't fly. Yeah. You've removed the flight surface. These are the long decorative feathers that you'll typically see when mm-hmm. decorative feathers, not the fluffy ones, but these long yeah. ones. These are also the feathers you might put on the back of an arrow. Yes. Uh, if you want it to fly nicely. Yep, yep. Because these feathers are adapted to providing lift and thrust. They tend to be asymmetrical. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. one vein will be shorter and the other side, the vein will be longer. To create that airfoil. Mm-hmm. Other vein feathers include rectrices, which are tail feathers, which also provide lift. Most birds today have a fan of tail feathers sticking off of their very short tailbone. I didn't know those were separate categories. I thought those were kind of the same. Yeah, they have a different name. They often are different in structure. Mm-hmm. They, they, uh, I, as far as I know, uh, tail feathers aren't asymmetrical. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. All the time, the way that uh, fly, uh, wing feathers might be. Because they don't have a leading edge the same way mm-hmm. that a wing does. All right, all right. Uh, And then there are also contour feathers. These are the feathers that cover the body of the bird. Contour feathers are important in creating a streamlined body shape. So they're not providing lift or thrust, but they're still important for flight because they are creating that aerodynamic, smooth shape of the body of the bird. (laughs) For a second, I had like contour, not condor. Not a condor feather. Though condor have condor. Condor, Condors have contour feathers. (laughs) There are condor contour feathers. Not all feathers are condor feathers. (laughs) (laughs) This is true. (laughs) Many condor feathers are contour feathers. So vein feathers, you've got flight wing feathers, you've got tail feathers, you've got contour feathers across the body. This is the classic view of feathers. There are many other types of feathers. (laughs) Uh, One of the most important other types of feathers are called plumulaceous feathers, also called downy feathers. Yeah. Or down. These feathers, there's a variety of ways that down is structured. Often these don't have a central rachis, that sort of central stem. They often are uh, basically a tangle of loose branches. So barbs, but without that sort of nice organized structure, they'll have barbules on them, but they don't zip together the same way. It it forms sort of a floofy, fluffy, tangled shape, which is really good for trapping air pockets, which makes downy feathers very good for insulation. Yes. Uh, Chicks are often covered in downy feathers. Baby birds are often covered in downy feathers. Adult birds usually have downy feathers underneath their contour feathers. They have sort of an internal uh, layer there. Uh, certain birds, uh, like ostriches and some flight, not non-flying birds, flightless birds, will be more downy than typical contour. It's part of the reason why ostriches are kind of floofy. Yeah. They, they, they have more of that downy structure to them. Uh, these are also the feathers that you will find if you've ever taken apart a pillow or a jacket. Yep. Like a down jacket, they're good for insulation. That's why we put them in those jackets. I used to love, uh, as a kid, I had a downy pillow. And every now and then, the end of the, the, the quill, you know, like the, the point. It, yeah, it'll, point, it'll stick out. Pick, point out. And I'd pull it out, and then there'd be the feather. And I remember noting that it's they're floofy. But you can still see the, the the idea of that feather shape. And like some of them would have a slightly zipped together like tip with like a flat area. Yeah. So it's like the feathers in there, but it's just poof. And that's actually a really important point that it isn't just downy feathers and veined feathers. There's plenty of in between. Some downy feathers are more of a tangle than others. Contour feathers, the the properly veined feathers on birds, often are veined in the top section, but at their base, they have more of a downy tangle. So it is a little bit of both, Mm -hmm. so that it's insulating at the base and then streamlining at the top. And when you you uh, uh, line those up on the bird body and then lay them flat, all you see is the flat tip. Yes. Because they are now all covering the downy bottom portion. And they have a layer underneath that is keeping them warm or whatnot. Which is why birds are such optical illusions of like (laughs) when you finally touch them. And it's like, you're not even there where I'm seeing you. You're like two inches (laughs) in from that. Some feathers are also called semi-plumes, 
which are effectively veined feathers like a like a typical contour feather, but they don't have hooklets. Yes. So they don't zip together, so they end up being a little looser. So there is a spectrum from f- fully plumulaceous, downy tangle, to nice, zipped, smooth, veined feathers. Well, it's a, it's a very cool diversity where you can just see how adjusting the length of that central mm-hmm. rachis or removing the hooks or reducing the like just adjusting different aspects you can get a huge variety of feather shape yeah there are variations on a basic theme yes there are other even simpler feathers there are bristles Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which are a type of feather found on birds that are basically just a, a filament yeah kind of like a strand of hair these tend to be relatively short. They are often a very stiff. So it's essentially just the rachis, just that central shape with, with little or no branches. These are often found on the face, around the eyes, or the nostrils, or the mouth. They're thought to be protective, sort of keep dust and stuff out, kind of like eyelashes and whatnot. Makes sense. And also thought to be potentially sensory. Oh, like whiskers. Like whiskers, that you can feel what's going on around those sensitive areas. These are very simple little filaments that birds are making use of. There's also a similar uh, type of feather called phyloplumes. These are a long, stiff rachis, that central filament, with a tuft of barbs at the very top. Yes. So it's long and naked and then a tuft at the top. These are also thought to be sensory feathers these are these tend to be found around the base of larger flight or body feathers and they're thought to help the bird sense the orientation of the feathers so like if a feather's out of place they can sense it thanks to these little phyloplumes oh weird yeah which you as you would imagine is extremely important because flight relies so much on making little adjustments to the position of your feathers. Yeah, that's why you see planes do that check where all the flaps move to make yes. sure everything is not only in the right position, but able to be adjusted. I wouldn't have thought they'd need the, that. Out. It's, it's just seemed to me like you would be able to sense it through the tissue and muscle. Yeah. This apparently helps to refine that sensation. Ooh, that's cool. So... These these are kind of the general types, the classic types of feathers. One of the main things to get across here uh, that I think is important is feathers are a lot more diverse than you think they are. Yes. There are several main types of feathers, and then there's tons of variation on these different th- forms and structures of feathers. The variation of the feathers tends to be correlated to what the feathers are doing. We will eventually start going into detail on the evolution of feathers. And part of understanding the evolution of feathers is knowing that structure. Like you said, we're look- we can- you can see how little changes can adjust the shape and structure of the feathers. Also, understanding their function is very important for understanding the pressures driving the evolution of feathers. The functions of feathers <laughs> are... Me- I found a great paper that I will link in the blog post that the majority of the paper is just listing functions of feathers. Just things feathers can do. It's awesome. (laughs) I have created a short version of this list. I have separated these functions into loose categories. Here is a brief discussion of some of the functions of feathers. Feathers function in locomotion. Mm -hmm. Uh, We talked about flight. Uh, Wing and tail feathers come in a variety of different shapes for different styles of flight. Feathers are also important for swimming. Yeah. There are a lot of birds that use their wings to swim through the water. The feathers on the wings of swimming birds are often stiffer and often shorter to create a sturdier thrusting surface. Some birds also use their feathers for balance or for bracing. Now, uh, one version of this is birds will, like birds of prey, will sit on top of something and hold their wings out to kind of balance themselves. Another version of this, a bunch of birds, woodpeckers are famous for this, have tail feathers that are extra long and extra sturdy to brace themselves against a surface. Yes. Like a kickstand. Yeah, so they can hold on to the 
tree trunk and then lean back and the tail keeps them from falling backwards. Yes, also helps to offset the force of them <laughs> smashing their faces into yeah. the tree. Face punching bark. <laughs> <laughs> so feathers are important for locomotion in various ways. They function in protection. We already mentioned insulation. We mentioned the sort of bristles around face structures. Many feathers are also water repellent. Yes. A uh, part of this has to do with the air pockets that the fe- these downy feathers trap within them. They make them impermeable to water. That water can't get through the air pockets and it helps them to be water repellent, which also helps birds to float yeah. on the water. So this is another locomotion thing. Some feather structures are thought to be good for deterring certain parasites. A bunch of birds will also use feathers to line their nests. They will put feathers in the structure of the nest. This is thought to help insulate the nest, potentially keep out some parasites. I also found one uh, paper that pointed out this could also help in muffling sounds Oh yeah, from the nest. If you've got a bunch of noisy little chicks in there, the feather coating might help hide the sound a bit. That makes sense. Uh, birds will use their own feathers. There are also some birds that will fly right up to other birds and pull feathers out of them to then go use them in their nests. Yep. Uh, some birds are very mean. <laughs> we mentioned sensory functions, the bristles, those phyloplumes. And of course, feathers are extremely valuable for many functions in display and communication. Oh yeah. Feathers are birds' main source of showiness. Yes. Feathers are often colored and patterned. These colors and patterns can come from pigments like our hair. It's also pretty common for feathers to have structural coloration. That is, there's not a pigment that gives off a certain color, like a molecule in there. The physical shape of the feather refracts or reflects light in such a way that it comes out blue yes. or iridescent. Some birds also uh, have secretions that they spread over their feathers, that can change their color. Some birds also apparently have feathers that they will crush with their beaks into a powder that they will then spread over other feathers to change their color. Oh, wow. Which is very strange and weird. That's weird. The coloration and pattern on on feathers is good for camouflage, for mimicry, for threat displays, and of course for courtship and fancy displays, which is one of the things that birds are most famous for. There are tons of variations in bird feathers that they use for doing fancy displays. Crests of feathers on the head, long tail feathers, peacocks that have just that preposterous train of long feathers sticking out the back of them. Any bird of paradise, name one. There's that one that I see on memes all the time with the wire-like feathers sticking out of it. Tons of feather variation for display uh, display functions. Well, I think the thing that always stands out most to me about display in birds using their feathers is that it's not just that they have a particular color or shape of feathers to use for display, but that they can rearrange the position of the feathers so that they can just take on a shape that they weren't a second ago. Yeah. Which is not something a lot of vertebrates can do to just be like, I'm going to be this shape now. But we can, our, our hair can stand on end. And sure. so we can get poof, like mammals can get poofy. But a bird can go from being shaped like a bird to being shaped like an umbrella. Yes. Very quickly by just raising or lowering the f- base of the feather and having them stick out in very particular ways. Yeah. If any of you listening out there aren't familiar with the kind of things we're talking about, look up Birds of Paradise. Yes. Look at like BBC Birds of Paradise and just watch them do their preposterous umbrella dances. Feathers are also sometimes functional on the other side of communication, helping helping birds to hear things Mm -hmm. uh owls yes very famously they're not the only ones but uh some owls have discs of feathers on their face that help like a satellite dish to collect and amplify sounds which helps them to hear better owls are also a famous group of of birds that have feathers that are adapted to silence their own movements yep so they can fly very silently 
There are also lots of birds that use their sa- their feathers to make noise. Which is so cool. <laughs> there are birds that will do, you know, flutter. Yes. Uh, there are birds that'll flutter and flap to startle things, because it may I've been startled by fluttering and flapping birds. Mm-hmm. Some birds do uh, wing clapping, like clap their feathers together. There are at least some birds, uh, mannequins are famous for these, that have special ridges on some of their feathers that they use to stridulate. Stridulation! They run their uh, the, the stiff part of one feather across ridges on the opposite feather, like a grasshopper. Yeah. And it creates this, like, high-pitched whining noise. Wait, Go- Google it. I'll, I, if I can, I'll put some uh, links yes. in the episode in the, uh, the blog post. Which it's it like that's an insect thing. That's yes. what insects do. You're doing do. a bug thing. You have to have at least six limbs to stridulate, <laughs> and you're a bird. Yeah, and it's this very weird noise. Like they they rub their feathers together, and it goes. Yeah, and you're like, that's not a noise that that should make. Yeah, I know what noise feathers make. I also know I saw, I, once again, I saw this from a, a True Facts video. <laughs> uh, hummingbirds will have some feathers that make noise, not from like flapping, but when they fly fast enough. So they'll do little swoops and then it will vibrate at a frequency to create particular little sounds that they'll use during courtship. Oh, cool. So they have, it's it's like if you've ever done the grass between your thumbs and blown to mm-hmm. make a little whistle kind of a uh, 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 instrument. So they're like those Nerf footballs. Yes. Yes. <laughs> if you if you move fast enough, yes, you get a whistling through it. Precisely. Wow. <laughs> well, uh, my last category of feather functions is a category that I've just called other stuff, <laughs> which is here's just some other examples that I came across that I wanted to mention. Feel free to add some if you think of some. Black herons are among birds that are known to spread out their wings to create a shady spot. For, then prey will come and seek the shade, and then they will eat them. Yep. Sand grouses have specialized feathers that they use to carry water to their nests. Yeah. Crested auklets have feathers that smell like tangerines, for, <laughs> for some reason, apparently. <laughs> uh, we don't know why. Uh, Pitohuis are birds whose feathers are toxic. Oh, wow. They have toxins them. in their feathers to defend against perhaps parasites, perhaps predators. These are just a few examples of the utterly ridiculous things that birds do with feathers. And it's it's so cool. They can also do stuff like, you know, camouflage with their feathers. You know, we talked about that in a recent episode. Uh, but, like, because they can molt, they can also have different seasonal colorations. Yeah, they can and... change colors throughout the year. Another really valuable and important thing to note about feathers is that they also vary in their arrangement On the body. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Birds are not fully feathered. Birds tend to be covered in some combination of feathers, scales, and skin. Mm -hmm. Bare skin. Most birds are feathery across most of the body and have scaly feet. Yes. Uh, Scales, somewhat like reptilian scales. Scales on the feet and lower parts of the legs. Yeah, picture a chicken foot and that that gets you the good image. Some birds will have... Naked parts of the body, parts with little to no feathering and no scales. The heads and necks of vultures, for example, are like this. The legs of ostriches Mm -hmm, are mm -hmm. a really good example. They are mostly bare skin, and then there's scales down at the foot. Well, like around the eye of parrots is that's a thing that I always think is very distinctive for them. So the arrangements of feathers can change. A little, just a little side note here: the note that. Birds have varying degrees of different arrangements of feathers, scales, and skin. We'll come up again later (laughs) when we talk about dinosaurs. (laughs) All in all, tons of variation in feathers, tons of diversity, tons of different functions. Feathers are an extraordinarily complex set of features. Examining the evolution of feathers include there's tons of convergence. There's tons of evolutionary trade-offs. Bird feathers do multiple functions and birds have several types of feathers on their body it is an extremely variable set of features which makes it that much more interesting and complicated to examine the evolution of feathers it's kind of got the the eyeball thing that people <laughs> is like how in the world did something this versatile and complex come to be well, and with feathers there's also so many different 
shapes and varieties. Yes, yes. That the evolution is by necessity very complicated. Mm -hmm. Going this direction and that direction, tons of different selective pressures. As we are trying to understand feather evolution, our insights tend to come from two main places. One is fossils. More on that later. The other is examining the development of feathers in modern day birds. This is a common way to get insights into feathers. So with that in mind, before we go into sort of a fossil history of feathers, I want to address the question of the origins of feathers. Not like the deep time, where did they, you know, when, when did they originate? But what is the ancestral structure of a feather? Mm -hmm. What did feathers evolve from? This is a longstanding question. There is a classic answer, and this is the answer that I had in my head, which is that feathers evolved from scales. Yes. You had early reptiles that had scales, and some of those scales gave rise to feathers. Yeah, basically you stretched a scale out and then gave it those barbs on the sides. Right. You got a feather. Well, and there are scales that form like little spines. Yes. The tons of reptiles have spiny scales. Uh, this makes sense for that reason. Birds are reptiles. Like the ancest- the ancestry tree of birds were scaly animals. Yep. Also, as I mentioned before, bird feathers and reptile scales share those corneas beta proteins. So th- this intuitively makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and birds are still scaled themselves. Absolutely. So it seems like you've got the you've got the ability to make one for sure. Perhaps the other came from there. However, apparently there is debate about whether this is the case. Uh, During development, feathers originate from uh, structures called placodes. These are thickened sections of skin that, as the skin develops, these form, they start out by forming the hollow tubes, and they stretch into the central rachis, and then they grow barbs and, and so on. Reptile scales also form from placodes in their development, as do fish scales, mammal hair, shark denticles, and teeth, uh, as we discussed in episode 88. So feathers have this in common with scales, but they also have this in common with tons of skin integumentary structures. Yeah, this is this is a good way. To, this is how you build something that's going to stick out of your skin. Yes. <laughs> uh, researchers have noted that the genetic toolkit, so the genes that code for feather development, the whole suite of genetic pathways, that genetic toolkit for the regulation of feather development is very similar to the genetic toolkit for the development of fish scales, hair, teeth, and so on. The genetic underpinnings of feathers are very similar to reptile scales and mammal hair. Okay. That the earliest amniotes probably had basically all the tools that they would have needed to make feathers. This this is a genetic system that goes way, way back. This understanding has led to uh, two main hypotheses about feathers. It could be that feathers derive from scales. You had reptilian scales, and then some of those turn eventually gave rise to feathers. But it could also be that feathers are just an independently evolved structure, that they didn't come from scales or from hair. They're just another thing that developed within the skin. It came about on their own from the same toolkit. Yes. So it seems to not be as clear-cut as I thought it was to say feathers came from scales. They might not have come from scales. They might be an independent structure. Which, and it, it, it makes sense how, I can absolutely see how we can, it, it was easy to get hooked on the idea that they came from scales because scales came first. Like, we had scaly things before we had feathered things. Mm-hmm. And it's very easy to draw that conclusion of, okay, so... Did one begot the other? Yeah. Uh, and they're very similar they're very in their similar. structure and their development. So we had lots of reasons to look at it that way. But it also makes complete sense that you could just develop feathers. Just a separate <laughs> origin. Yeah. This is further complicated by research on bird scales. Classically, we might uh, imagine that, well, birds are reptiles, so bird scales are basically the same as reptile scales. Uh-huh. This might not be the case. There has been some research that has found, that has done compare, morphological comparisons, molecular comparisons. One particular study I saw referenced a couple times 
that found compared chicken scales with gator scales, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. alligators the, among the closest relatives of birds among reptiles, and found that structurally chicken scales are surprisingly different from alligator scales, but very similar to feathers on chickens. Yeah. Other experiments have found that either through mutation or genetic, like experimenting with genetics, if the development of chicken scales is interrupted in a certain way, they will take on an elongated feather-like shape. Huh. These pieces of information have led to the hypothesis that bird scales might be derived from feathers. Yeah. Not only are we not sure that feathers evolved from reptilian scales, it might be that bird scales are secondarily advanced feathers. Which which sounds so crazy. But as you were saying it, I had that moment in the news you mentioned that the skin <laughs> we found was more like croc scale, not overlapping than lizard and snake scale. And a lot of scales on bird feet are kind of overlapping. Yeah, birds tend to have, on the leg, they have these more overlapping yeah. lizard-like scales. And on the feet, they'll have these sort of pebbly, yes. dome-like scales. Now, I don't recall if they found that there was something different. Between those two. I think uh, I remember them saying that that unusual formation of the scales was noted in the feet scales. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I don't remember specifically. But just as you were saying that, I had that moment of, yeah, their scales don't actually look super crocky in a lot of ways, which they you'd expect them to be since they're archosaur. They're, they're both in the same yep. overall reptile group. Also, if you picture the structure of a feather we were talking yeah. about, it's not a huge stretch to imagine that just taking on a more solid... Yeah, going the opposite direction of what we were saying, just... Becoming less elongated. So when I was planning this, I put in my outline originally and I was like, cool, I'll just put a little note here, uh, a little part here to talk about the development of feathers uh, and how how we know that they came from reptilian scales and just a little note about that. Uh, And what I discovered is uh, we don't know that and we don't know uh, what feathers and scales are doing there. We this is an unresolved question. The relationship between reptile scales, bird scales and feathers. And, when, and like, I'm I'm reorganizing all my thoughts that I've had about, because I'd always been like, yeah, it makes sense that it come from a scale. But every time I was saying that, I was definitely picturing like a lizard or snake scale. Right. Uh, those which, are not the ancestors of birds. Which is not the necessarily the scale they would have been working from. Croc scales, it's, it's a bit more difficult for me to just picture becoming a feather. And a lot of dinosaur scales exactly. that we know are sort of pebbly yeah. or hexagonal scales. Because that seems to be very likely the more archosaur scale type. So it actually does make a lot of... It, it makes more sense than I would have thought now that yeah. I'm thinking about it that they it doesn't fit that they just surely had to come from that structure. Yes. Weird! So, where did feathers originate? Moving on, wherever they came from, however feathers actually got started, there has been lots of research and discussion around what steps would have been taken in the evolutionary path of feathers. And this is informed by embryology. It's informed by how they develop. It's informed by the different structures of feathers that we see. Generally, and going back quite a ways, researchers have proposed a sequence of events in the evolutionary development of feathers, which it seems to me to be pretty intuitive. Mm -hmm. The general idea is that the earliest versions of feathers probably would have looked like the simplest base of feathers today, probably starting as single filaments, kind of like hair, probably little hollow tubes, like at the base of most feathers today. We can imagine that once that was established at some point later down the line, those could have given rise to clusters of filaments that were joined at the base, kind of like a lot of downy feathers, and or at some point filaments with branches coming off, filaments that split near the top or that had, you know, tufts of sort of frayed edges, Mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. beginnings of branching. Then if those structures became advantageous, 
we can see that giving rise to more organized branching, more complex, you know, fractal branching, like you said, and that sort of veined feather s- structure of a central filament with branches coming off the sides of it, which could then diversify into a variety of different shapes. Exactly what steps happened at what time in what order did they happen multiple times did they happen all at the same time that is very difficult to say but considering how complex the structure of a feather is it's fairly intuitive to imagine what evolutionary stages that might have gone through to go from simple hair-like filaments to the complex structures we see today yes and those sort of stages in some form or another do seem to be supported by the way that feathers develop. They're developmentally, they start out as little hollow tubes that then branch later, and the fossil record. Yeah. Which brings us to the topic that I'm sure uh, everyone has been waiting for, a topic that has come up on this podcast a bunch, of feathers in the fossil record. What does the fossil record show us about the evolution and history of feathers? What animals had feathers in the past? We're going to take a short break, and when we get back, we will get into, we will spend the whole rest of the episode talking about feathers in the fossil record. Stay tuned. Despite the fact that feathers are made of very sturdy proteins, they are still technically soft tissue. Yeah. Which means, uh, unlike bones and teeth, feathers do not fossilize very well. Not uh, sturdy enough. Feathers, scales, hair, these are the kinds of things that tend to decompose, not be preserved as fossils. This means that even bird, like fossil birds, are usually just bones. Uh, we don't tend to get feathers outside of exceptional localities with very good soft tissue preservation. Most of the time that we find fossils of feathers, they are compression fossils. Mm -hmm. That, Like a leaf compression, they were pressed between layers of sediment, and what is preserved is usually a carbonized remnant in the shape of that feather. Uh, This was the the very first fossil identified of Archaeopteryx, uh, which I think, I could be wrong about this, I think might have also been the first ever fossil feather described. I think so. That like, might that be sounds right. right. In the mid-1800s was a single feather pressed into the sediment. There are also examples of feathers in amber. Uh, we've talked about a bunch of these on the podcast in the news before. Uh, often these are isolated feathers. Sometimes they are uh, associated with parts of the animal that they had grown on. Yep. The wings or the tail. We can also get indirect evidence of feathers from the skeletons of some animals. A very famous example of this are what are called quill knobs on birds today that have very large feathers sticking off of the arms. They will actually anchor into the bone. And there are these little knobs, this row of little knobs in the limb bone where those quills anchor against the body. Knobs like those have been found in some fossils uh, of animals that would have had feathers. Famously, this is the evidence we have for feathers on Velociraptor, and also, I believe, Dakota Raptor, evidence of quill knobs. So we can get direct feathers in sediment, direct feathers in amber, and sometimes hints of feathers on the uh, the skeletons of animals. The quill knobs have always been so extreme to me, because that's like, I, I did not know that until I, and I think it was through Velociraptor that I learned about quill knobs and found out that's like that, you can have feathers that go all the way to your bone. That's, in, that's like the penguin tongue anchoring at the, the <laughs> pelvis. Right. Of just like, that's like if you had hair that was, that was so sturdy, it had to go all the way to your thigh bone. Yeah. That's I, weird. I don't actually know what the, I don't know if it like goes into the bone or if it's anchored like beside yeah, the yeah, bone. Yeah, yeah. But I don't that, actually know off the top of my head. There are features on the bone. Yes. To help anchor those in those are some sturdy those (laughs) those aren't coming out those are important feathers (laughs) dude can't lose these (laughs) the skin going here bone hold this yeah (laughs) hold my quill that being said despite the rarity of feathers in the fossil record there are lots of fossil animals with feathers on them the majority of these 
are birds. As you might expect, Cenozoic birds with feathers are known from a number of exceptional localities. For example, the Messel Pit in Germany, which we discussed in episode 160, the Green River Formation uh, here in North America, uh, which we have discussed sporadically here and there from time to time. <laughs> Both of these are Eocene localities that are famous for preserving like whole fish and bats and stuff. Both of them have preserved feathers on birds along with soft tissues. There are also lots of feathered birds from the Mesozoic. Going back yet further, extinct lineages of birds, animals on the bird line, like early ancestors, uh, members of a, of a lineage called the Avialans. This includes Archaeopteryx, the famous first bird, preserved in the Solenhofen limestone, where those feathers are pressed into the sediment. There are some Multiple very famous, lovely specimens of Archaeopteryx just surrounded in the impressions of feathers in the sediment. There are tons of other birds, uh, many true birds, many extinct groups of birds, like the Enantiornaths, which were very common and widespread during the Cretaceous. A lot of ancient birds with feathers known from other exceptional sites, very famously from Asia, across China, places like the Jehol Biota, we also have feathers in amber from the Cretaceous period, including a famous example of uh, an Antiornith. I think they were wings. Oh, yes, yes, yes. With feathers on them. What's really interesting to note about all of these ancient birds and almost bird, bird line animals is that the variety of feathers that we see across all of these ancient birds is basically the same as what we see in birds today. They had flight feathers on the wing covered in body feathers. We see downy feathers. We see different types of feathers. There are multiple examples of fossil feathers in these groups with signs of pigmentation and evidence of what colors and patterns they had. Bird feathers have been bird feathers like we know them today, basically as long as there have been birds. Yeah. All the way back to the late Jurassic with things like Archaeopteryx. There are also among these ancient feathered birds some feather features that we don't see in modern birds today. One really notable example is that a lot of these birds have long wing-like feathers on their hind legs. In mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, uh ten tended to have this. Archaeopteryx had these, where the legs had extensive plumage that seem to have probably been acting like an extra set of wings. Whether or not they were flapping or whatnot, at least aerodynamic wing-like shapes on both front and back legs. Many extinct groups of birds in the Mesozoic also don't have a tail fan yeah. of feathers. Now, some, like like Archaeopteryx, have long bony tails. Yes. But they don't have the little pega style for the fan to anchor to. They had long bony tails with feathers on them. But the Enantiornaths, again, that very common group of Cretaceous birds, tended not to have a tail fan. Instead, it sounds like they often had just a pair of long tail feathers. Yeah. Which might suggest that they were flying differently or using their tails differently. It is very odd to picture a proper flying bird bird without a little fan of feathers on the butt. Well, it, it, it feels like it at a glance, has to be a worse flying surface, so to speak. Right. Because you've reduced it. Like, you've reduced down to these two yeah. long feathers instead of a full fan. So it's hard for us to imagine what you were doing with that since that's so alien to what birds are doing today. Yeah, and maybe they were. Maybe they were poorer flyers yeah. or just different flyers. Mm -hmm. Speaking of tail feathers... The Cretaceous bird Confucius Ornus, a very famous early branch of birds, also doesn't have a tail fan. Their tail, their pica style, has a tuft of little feathers around the base of the tail, and then two very long feathers sticking out, each of which is a long shaft, and at the end of it there is a, a vein structure like you'd imagine on a typical feather today. Huh. These are interesting because, number one, we don't have feathers like that today. Yeah. There are ancient 
fe- there are ancient types of feathers that we don't see in the variety of bird feathers today. Also, this is one of the few often cited, very likely examples of display structure. Yes. Uh, this is a, v- it's very funny to look at a pair of feathers and go, well, we don't have feathers that are quite that structure today. But we we are pretty dang sure we know what you're doing with those. Yeah. Because we have a lot of birds that have similar things yes. that are doing something very similar. Yeah, the first thing that made me think of was a peacocks, where mm-hmm. they have and that, that spade-like expanded end. Yeah, and it is the... kind of, that's mm-hmm. what it kind of looks like on these. Cool. Another interesting example of these is Anchiornis. Anchiornis is often considered to be a very early member of this bird line known with a full body covering of feathers. This is one of the oldest known animals with feathers, period. Yeah. Late Jurassic, 160 million years old. Cool. There has been some research, some recent research, that analyzed the molecular structure, the protein structure of Anchiornis feathers, and they found that there, these feathers had those CBPs, those proteins that modern, that the quote beta keratin. But whereas modern birds, it's mostly those corneous beta proteins, the Anchiornis feather appeared to be mostly keratin, proper keratin. Oh. Now, this has been questioned. There have been other studies that have, uh, or re- responses that have said, well, maybe, are, are you actually detecting the proteins properly? But if they are, this might indicate a transition in the molecular structure of feathers from being more keratin to then later more of those CBPs. And they even suggested that it's possible that those corneous beta proteins might be important for true flight. Yeah. That that may have been something that had to show up to then support true flight in birds. Interesting. So, Ancient bird feathers are not all the same as modern bird feathers. We have, there's there's yet more variation when we look in the fossil record. That's always an interesting thing to be reminded of, that just because ancient members of, per- perchance, the same lineage that have seemingly the same structures doesn't mean they were growing them the same way. Yes. Doesn't mean they were for sure doing the same exact stuff. Those feathers might have been built different Yes. Like literally, <laughs> literally com- built different, literally composed of different <laughs> materials. So who knows how they behave physically, you know, like, like what the mechanics of those feathers were compared to today's mm-hmm. cool. So birds going all the way back to their earliest members in the late Jurassic had a very similar variety of feathers that we see today, probably serving basically all the same functions as feathers that we see today. This is very cool, but it also means that if we want to understand the evolution, early evolution of feathers, we have to leave birds in order to get there. We have to incept deeper. For a very long time, uh, 130 years or so from that first Archaeopteryx feather that was described, the only feathers in the fossil record were known from birds. True birds or early members like Archaeopteryx. It was suspected by many paleontologists that relatives of birds might also have feathers, but we didn't have fossils of them. This changed during our lifetime. If you're anywhere near our age, during our lifetime, 1996, the discovery of the first definitive feathered non-bird dinosaur. This was the discovery of Cynoceropteryx, which is a small theropod, a member of the Compsognathids, covered not in flight feathers, not in like wings and such, but in simple down-like tufts and filaments all over the body. Cynoceropteryx was found in the part of the Jehobiota, the Liaoning province of China, an area with fine ash layers that uh, facilitate excellent preservation. This was very important. Not only was this the first feathered non-bird dinosaur ever found, the first direct evidence that yes, other dinosaurs had feathers, but told us where to look and what to look for. It has been not quite 30 years since Cynoceropteryx was discovered, and since then, paleontologists have found hundreds (laughs) of fossils of feathered non-bird dinosaurs, including dozens of species. Uh, Wikipedia has a list of non-bird dinosaurs with feathers on them. That list, as of this recording, has 60 species listed on it. So cool. Tons of species 
of non-bird dinosaurs were feathered. These have been found across... China is a great place. Lots of fossil localities in China. Also, examples from Mongolia, from Germany, from Canada, and more. Many of these are essentially as feathery as birds. Almost indistinguishable in their variety of feathers. There are several groups of dinosaurs close to birds, close to the avialin lineage, that have the same overall diversity of feathers as birds, including members from the dromaeosaurs. Mm -hmm. This includes Velociraptor, Dakotaraptor, Microraptor, very famously. Troodontids, the line that includes Troodon, very similar to the dromaeosaurs. Scansoriopterygids, which is the group that includes Scansoriopteryx. I think Epidixipteryx is in here and other dinosaurs uh, with impossible names. The Oviraptorosaurs, yeah. which includes Oviraptor and City Potty and a lot of those sort of beaked, crested dinosaurs. All of these groups have members with a variety of feathers, including simple filaments, bristles, down-like feathers, and veined pe- feathers, penaceous feathers. Many have long, veined feathers on the arms, the legs, the tail. A dinosaur like Velociraptor would have looked like a bird. Yes. Covered in feathers, much like modern birds. Some dinosaurs within this group show partial feathering. So they, a, a bunch of them have scaly feet. Yes. Like birds today. Various members will have scales or even uh, patches of skin where we get the integument preserved. We have examples of dinosaurs with feathers in some places and then scales or skin in other places among these lineages microraptor is a very famous example very small crow sized dromaeosaur that had long feathers on the arms long feathers on the back legs which was common among a lot of these but microraptor is famous because its long feathers were asymmetrical yeah which is a feature of flight feathers yep which has led to the suggestion that microraptor was probably at least a capable glider. Yep, yep. And who knows, potentially uh, even somewhat of a flyer. Much discussion in scientific circles has been devoted to the question of what all these feathers on these dinosaurs were doing. Because, again, the first thing that comes to mind when you think about feathers is that feathers are flying. Yeah. For flying, that's what you use to fly. These are dinosaurs that have penacious, broad veined feathers like birds tend to have. But most of these dinosaurs were clearly not flying. Yeah, yeah. The very clear, you're too big. You don't have enough feather covering. You're just not an aerodynamic shape. Yeah, you're, you're mostly legs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but as we discussed before, birds use their feathers for all sorts of stuff. It's very likely that dinosaurs in these groups were using feathers for display, for insulation, for protection, for all those kinds of things. It's been suggested that especially the floofier or broader feathers on the arms might have been helpful for brooding. Yes. We have examples of oviraptorosaur dinosaurs preserved sitting over their eggs, their nest of eggs with their arms spread out to the side, mm-hmm. where their wing feathers may have covered up their eggs. There have been lots of suggestions of what these dinosaurs may have been doing with partially aerodynamic feathers if they weren't actually flying with them we talked earlier about balancing Mm -hmm. that you know animals uh, some birds will use their wings to balance there we've talked before on the podcast about uh, what is called wing assisted incline running yep yep which is something we see baby birds do today when running up a steep slope flapping their wings to help them climb up a steep slope yes Smaller dinosaurs with broad feathers could also have been using them to parachute, Mm -hmm. slow their descent, maybe even gliding. There are a bunch of different reasons that almost flying feathers could be functional in a variety of ways in these dinosaurs. I've often wondered about uh, for running ones and ones that are high speed runners, either for chasing or running away if they'd be useful for turning and oh, yeah. stabilization. Because we see that with like cheetahs using their tails and other animals that use structures to stabilize themselves while running. Yeah, or could they be a, a brake? Yes. Uh, which birds use that today? That Absolutely. Is, adjust their their wings to brake in the air. Could you like use it as a, a brake to then help you turn or something? Could it, could it aid you in a leap? You know, like 
as you're going over something or leaping for an attack, like yeah. especially if you're attacking with your feet, mm-hmm. like some dromaeosaurs may have been, would it be able to stabilize that that attack leap? Yeah. Many of these groups also have longer arms than most of their relatives. Their shoulder and wrist joints are flexible in ways that would have allowed them to open their arms more widely, to bend their wrists the way that birds do when they fold up their wings. So there there seems to have been a variety of potential functions for all of this diversity of feathers, including uses for feathers that aren't quite good enough for flight but might be selected for aerodynamic properties that could then eventually become really good at parachuting or gliding and then flapping flight. Well, it makes me think of uh, the the spoiler on the back of high-speed cars, Mm -hmm. which is basically a wing. Yes. Just centered on the car and only pushing down, but it's the same general shape and structure. And that car is not flying. But it's needing... To manipulate the air in a similar way. Yes. In fact, that actually, the spoiler is very important to make sure the car doesn't fly. Yeah, we want the opposite of fly. (laughs) (laughs) Now, in terms of what this helps us to understand about the evolution of feathers, all of these groups, the Dromaeosaurs, Troodontids, Oviraptorosaurs, Scansoriaptorygians, and Avialan, the bird line, all of them are closely related to each other. They all form a family group, a clade called Penaraptora, mm-hmm. pen, Pena for the penaceous feathers. And that's important because the fact that these are all related and all of the groups within this overall group have evidence of this diversity of feathers is strong evidence that this is ancestral to this group. Yes. The early ancestors of all these groups had a variety of bird-like feathers, and then they all inherited that and adjusted them and diversified in various ways. This is really interesting because it suggests that bird-like feathers as we know them are ancestral to all of these groups. Yes. Birds are not the only bird-like animals when it comes to feathers. There are several other major lineages of dinosaurs. As we often bring up, a lot of bird features are dinosaur features. (laughs) Outside of this group... We do see feathers, but they are a bit different. There are several other major families of dinosaurs close to the Peneraptera that have a simpler array of feathers. These tend not to have those penaceous feathers, but do have down-like feathers and tufts and simple filaments. These include the Therizinosaurs, the Therizinosaurus, the famous scythe-clawed dinosaur and its many relatives, Ornithomimosaurs, which includes Ornithomimus and Gallimimus, the, quote, ostrich-like dinosaurs. Both of those groups have are known with down-like feathers, simple filaments. There have been some suggestions that some of them might have had veined feathers, mm-hmm. but it is uh, unclear. And then there are also Compsognathids, which includes Compsognathus, also Cynoceropteryx, which I mentioned before. These are generally small theropod dinosaurs, and tyrannosaurs. Yes. Both of these lineages have members with simple hair-like filaments or simple down-like filaments. Uh, what it, what you'll often hear called dino fuzz, <laughs> or more sort of technically proto-feathers. Yes. Proto-feathers are these very simple single filaments or simple branch, very simple branching structures or tuft-like, down-like structures that are considered to be likely early versions of feathers. Like we said before, this fits with our hypothesized how you would have started out on the road to a feather-like structure. Yes. All of these are still within the group of dinosaurs called theropods, the two-legged, mostly meat-eating group of dinosaurs. There are some more famous examples within these. Bapiosaurus is a therizinosaur, It has simple filaments and downy feathers across its body. It also has some types of feathers that might be unique to it. Oh. On the tail, it has feathers that are, instead of like a branching structure, they are several parallel filaments. Oh. Kind of like a ribbon structure. And they also have these long single filaments that are very broad 
that grow up to 15 centimeters long. Uh, Bapiosaurus would have been, this is a, a, an animal the size of like a large dog. I think the estimated weight was like 60 pounds or something, which at the time was the largest known feathered uh, animal. Yeah. Which is pretty cool. So Bapiosaurus was covered in downy feathers with these extra long feathers and then these weird little ribbons on the tail. So even out here, right outside of our, you know, we're starting to, to not have some of our familiar bird-like feathers. There are unusual feather types yes. that we don't see elsewhere. Which, which makes sense because like there's birds today. Like no other bird has a peacock feather mm-hmm. other than the peacock. There are birds today that have unique to them feathers. Yeah. So it makes complete sense that there'd be that happening within the feathered species outside of birds, among other dinosaurs. It's just weird to think that it might be a version we don't have any example of anymore. Yeah. That's super cool. Another example within these groups is Ornithomimus. Ornithomimus, the famous ostrich-like dinosaur. There are multiple specimens that show body feathers, feathers across a lot of the body, but at least one specimen that also has skin impressions that show that the legs were mostly bare skin. Like an ostrich. Yep. Which is mind-blowing to me that we looked at these animals just from the general shape of them and went, those look like an ostrich. And then decades later, we're finding that they also had floofy downy feathers and mostly bare legs. That they looked very much like an ostrich. Like an ostrich. That's (laughs) awesome. Well, and, and it screams to me that there is some very important function to those bare legs. Yeah. I've seen it suggested that it might be as simple as thermoregulation yep yep. like you're big and they're these are both uh running animals very clearly long-legged powerful thighed it might be important that your thighs don't overheat yeah you have this giant bundle of muscle (laughs) there to power this running and you don't want to burn that out so which is just cool that they seem to be under such similar pressures yeah Cynoceropteryx is an example of a compsognathid. This is that first ever feathered dinosaur covered in short down-like feathers with bands of color along the tail. Yeah. Uh, one more famous example from within these, because we got to mention Tyrannosaurs uh, somewhere in here. Euteranus is an early member of the Tyrannosaur lineage uh, from China. Most of these are from China. Ornithomimus is North American. Euteranus is known for multiple specimens with preserved feathers, simple filaments, you know, those proto-feathers over most of the body. These got quite long. The longest ones were apparently up to 20 centimeters long. Oh, whoa. So, like, long filaments. That's shaggy. Yeah, Euteranus was a shaggy dinosaur. Huh. Euteranus is also, very famously, the largest known feathered animal ever that we have direct evidence of. I mentioned that Bapiosaurus was the sort of record holder for a while. Bapiosaurus at 60 pounds or so was the size of a big-ish dog. Euteranus at over a ton (laughs) is the size of a big-ish horse. Yeah. (laughs) It's a big animal. Uh, So we've got this wide variety of feathers in these other groups lacking some of the bird-like variety, but then with some extra variety that we don't see in other groups. Now, obviously, none of the feathers that we've talked about seeing in these groups seem to have any of that aerodynamic function to them, but they could still very easily be used for display, for insulation. I've also seen these proposed as an egg brooding thing. Yep, yep. They're like, yeah, if your body is fluffy and you're sitting over your eggs, that's going to be insulation for the eggs. Well, and they'd all be so fuzzy. All very fuzzy. Oh, very fuzzy dinos. That, one of my biggest regrets in life is I will never be able to pet and feel <laughs> how fuzzy any of these dinosaurs were. Yeah. that's a, It's a shame. A moment of silence for the missed opportunity. For, for all of those if pets we, if and we leave, pets if, that could never be. If we leave an actual moment of silence, the editing's going to cut it out. So yeah, we yeah. won't actually do that. Audacity do has imagine. no sympathy or, or nostalgia. Or sentiment. sentiment? Yeah, it goes, uh, I am here to do one job. Pause the podcast for a, for a brief moment uh, in a moment of silence. <laughs> now, turning to the question of evolution. All of these groups that I have mentioned are close cousins of the Peneraptera, which have those truly bird-like feathers. All together, these all form a related clade called Coelurosauria. Yeah. Every major lineage within Coelurosauria has some members with evidence of feathers. 
Once again, that is strong evidence that the early ancestors of coelurosaurs had at least simple proto-feather filaments, down, simple downy tufts, things like that. That means, this is important for the evolution of feathers, that suggests that any dinosaur within these groups has feathery ancestors. Yes. Some groups would then have gone on to develop to develop more complex feathers or partial feathering or full feathering. If there were groups within these lineages that had less feathers, they most likely had lost those feathers. Absolutely. This comes up uh, very famously with tyrannosaurs. Mm -hmm. The big tyrannosaurs, your T-Rex, Albertosaurus, Gorgosaurus, Displetosaurus. We don't have direct evidence of feathers from these dinosaurs. We do have, there was a paper not long ago that we talked about, some skin patches that show scaly skin on at least a handful of parts of the body of some of these dinosaurs, which has led some researchers to suggest that this is evidence that these tyrannosaurs would have had a limited feathery coating, possibly fairly few feathers. Some have even gone as far as to suggest they may have been all or mostly featherless. Yeah, just bare. If that was the case, if they were of limited feathering, that, that is a secondary trait. They would have had to evolve away from being fully feathered. Kind of like if you think about elephants or whales or mammals, their ancestors are fuzzy. Being fuzzy and filamentous and downy is a shared feature across this whole corner of the dinosaur family tree. Within coelurosaurs, feathers are the rule. Anyone who's lacking them is the exception. You're the weirdos. Outside of coelurosaurs... The rule seems to be no feathers. All the other major groups of dinosaurs are generally lacking evidence of feathers. We have lots of evidence of scales in a lot of other dinosaurs, sometimes partial scales, horn dinosaurs, armored dinosaurs, sauropods. We even have a handful of examples of dinosaurs where we have basically the entire body covering of scales without feathers. Which is crazy. Uh, Edmontosaurus is one of these. Carnotaurus is one of these. Uh, uh, Borealopelta, mm -hmm. the ankylosaur. So we have dinosaurs outside of the feather group that we can pretty confidently say, yeah, these were unfeathered. And then we have lots of other groups that we just don't have evidence of feathers for. So it would seem to be very easy for us to then conclude that feathers were absent across most of dinosaurs and showed up around the ancestors of the Solurosaurs, and then they all inherited that. There are mm -hmm. a handful, I'm going to mention five, uh, which I think are the five, yep. dinosaurs that mess up our picture of feather evolution and cause us to ask very important questions about the origins of feathers. <laughs> we know Solurosaurs were feathered as a rule. Outside of that, here are five. Sciuromimus is a small theropod from the late Jurassic of Germany, has been discovered with simple filament-like feathers, those proto-feathers, across multiple parts of the body. Exactly what family Sciuromimus belongs to has been debated. Some studies consider it to be a consignated. If that's the case, then this does not change anything about our understanding of feather evolution. That's one of the Solurosaur groups. No big deal. Other studies have suggested that it might belong to the family Megalosauridae. Ooh. That is more distant compared to the Coelurosaurs. If that's where Sauromimus belongs, that means either it is a separate origin of fuzz-like feathers, or that its fuzzy feathers are the same as the fuzzy feathers we see in the other ones, and that they would have inherited them from a common ancestor with Coelurosaurs. The common ancestor that is shared between megalosaurs and coelurosaurs is also the ancestor of several other major groups of theropod dinosaurs, including carcharodontosaurs, allosaurs, and spinosaurs. Wow, yeah, that's a wide range. So if Sauromimus is a megalosaurid, then it would suggest that the origin of fuzz is ancestral to all of those other groups of theropods, and we might expect that maybe they had the potential for feathers. Another similar example here is Concavenator. 
Concavenator is a Carcharodontosaurid, so the same group as Giganotosaurus and Acrocanthosaurus and Carcharodontosaurus. From the early Cretaceous of Spain, its arm bones have structures that have been interpreted as possible quill knobs, attachment sites for arm feathers. Oh, weird. This has been debated. Yes. If true, this has a very similar implication that shared ancestry of feathers might also include spinosaurs and allosaurs and carcharodontosaurs and such. So we have a couple of dinosaur fossils that might indicate the origin of fuzzy early feathers was earlier among theropod dinosaurs. And then there are three (laughs) ornithischian dinosaurs. Uh, These are the big three. These are the one when you look at what's the deal with dinosaur feathers, these three names come up. These names are Psittacosaurus, Tianyulong, and Coolindodromius. Psittacosaurus is a dinosaur from the early Cretaceous of Asia. It is an early ceratopsian, so a member of the horned dinosaur lineage. Small, two-legged, between one and two meters long. There is a famous specimen that we have talked about a bunch on this podcast, including last episode. Yup. That has evidence of soft tissues all over the body. It was covered in scales with a series of tall bristles along the tail in a row. I saw one paper describe it as a fence (laughs) of bristles down the tail. These are apparently hollow tube-like bristles that come in clusters of a few bristles each. They stick up, they are anchored in the skin, and they go up to 16 centimeters tall, very conspicuously sticking up off of the tail. Almost certainly some sort of display function uh, makes sense here. These might be feathers. Yep. They have a similar structure that we expect from early feathers. They have somewhat of a similar structure to some of the things we see in those near bird dinosaurs. They might be feathers. Yeah, I hadn't heard they were hollow. Uh, yeah. Which Th- is a, a, a yet another bit of, of v- very suspicious evidence of featheriness. Yes, I don't know how well established that is, Mm -hmm. that that might be one of those, maybe, maybe not. Yeah, yeah. But at least the potential to be hollow. Weird. Tianyulong is a heterodontosaurid, so an early branch of dinosaurs, from the late Jurassic of China. Small, two-legged, less than a meter long. At least one specimen of Tianyulong preserves fuzzy integument on the neck, the back, and the tail. Full body covering. These are long, single filaments, like strands of hair, up to a few centimeters long. They are hollow, round in cross-section. Again, very similar to what we expect from early feathers and what we see in those other uh, feathered theropods. These seem like they were probably maybe display function, maybe insulating. These are maybe the same thing as feathers. It's possible this is an independent, this is a similar structure that evolved separately, or that they are derived from the same origin as proper feathers. And then there's Coolindodromius. Coolindodromius is a basal ornithischian, a very early member of this large group of dinosaurs. From the middle Jurassic of Siberia, small, two-legged, between one and one and a half meters long. (laughs) Many specimens preserved in layers of ash, With integument, Calindodromius had various types of scales across the body and multiple types of filaments. These included hair-like filaments on the body, neck, and head, similar to that dino fuzz, those strands of filaments, bundles of ribbon-like structures composed of parallel filaments, very similar to the ones that have been described on Bapiosaurus, the Therizinosaur I mentioned before, and a... Seemingly wholly unique structure, scale-like plates with clusters of filaments coming off of them huh. on the arms and legs. Huh. Once again, could be display functions, could be insulatory functions. Shockingly similar yeah. in some respects to what we've seen on some other feathered theropods. And with a thing that doesn't match anything else. Yep. Those plates with the clusters coming off of them. Yeah, that that one really is a monkey wrench. Yeah, Calindodromius was discovered only a few years ago. It's mm-hmm. a relatively mm-hmm. new dinosaur. There has been tons of back and forth on these three dinosaurs as to whether or not 
these are homologous with feathers. That is to say, derived from the same ancestry as feathers. These are crucial because ornithischians are a whole other chunk of the dinosaur family tree. If these are not feathers, if these are something separate, then what that means is that feather-like structures showed up multiple times. Yeah. Across uh, dinosaurs. Bunch of times. At least twice, potentially four or five different times, we got these feather-like structures. Or if they are the same thing as regular feathers we see in the theropods, that would suggest that there is a shared ancestry, that they all inherited this from ancestors that had fuzz, the shared ancestors of those ornithischians and the theropods we talked about would also be the ancestors of basically all dinosaurs. Yeah. If these are the same structure, then that would suggest that dinosaurs ancestrally are fuzzy and feathery. Yup. Which would suggest that any dinosaurs we have down the line, like Carnotaurus and Edmontosaurus, that seem not to have feathers, are groups that lost their feathers not groups that never developed them. Yep. This is the big wrench in dinosaur feather evolution as of right now, 2024. Either feather-like structures evolved two or more times across dinosaurs, or the earliest dinosaurs were fuzzy and downy to some degree, and then that was inherited by a bunch of different groups. Yeah, and lost by even and more Lost teams. by a bunch of different groups. L- and that's kind of the reason that it's such a, a tough nut to crack is both scenarios are weird. Like, yeah, are unexpected. Are unexpected. If we got extremely similar structures evolving separately, potentially a handful of times, mm-hmm. that's weird. That yeah. That is very uh, interesting. Not unreasonable. You know, we no. mentioned that teeth, hair, scales, feathers all are originating from the same kind of cells yes. and multiple groups of animals have evolved hair like structures absolutely absolutely not unprecedented so by, by no means is that impossible but that would be a very unique and unusual example of convergent evolution yeah and it would be very interesting yes to know that dinosaurs have done that like that'd be that would be an extreme I- event of a, a, a convergence but then on the flip side, if it's ancestral to most dinosaurs, and then it seems like a ton of the dinosaurs just didn't keep them. Yeah. Or that we just haven't found yes. them yet. Maybe maybe they had them and it just wasn't enough covering for us to find them regularly. And that's real. like, I don't know, for example, that there are many sauropods in the Jehol biota. Yes, exactly. Where we get tons of these feathery dinosaurs. We don't have evidence for feathers on hadrosaurs or big tyrannosaurs, but we also don't tend to find those in the kinds of sediments where you might expect to get integument covering to give us that evidence very commonly. So it could be that it it could also be that we're wrong about a bunch of groups losing feathers and that they had them and we haven't found those fossils yet. And once again, also wouldn't be unreasonable though, if it was ancestral but did not become ubiquitous to the group, but persisted in a line that led to the groups that mm-hmm. it became. We have groups today that maintain things that are no longer common among mammals, but are common in a couple of groups. Yes. And so that can happen. So there is th- this open question now. We know this one corner of the dinosaur family tree over here in the Silurosaurus Feathers. Yes. You had feather. If you didn't have feathers and you're in that group, you're kind of a weirdo. That's the feathery group. Outside of that, there's a whole lot of big questions. Yeah. Now, I am not a dinosaur paleontologist. I have not done any research on feather structures in the fossil record. If I were betting, uh, my bet would be that the earliest dinosaurs had some kind of fuzz or at least the potential for more diverse filamentous covering. Yeah. It seems to be a very reasonable hypothesis that early dinosaurs had some sort of fuzz. This is complicated (laughs) yet further by the last group of animals that I'm going to talk about, pterosaurs. Who just always make evolutionary conversations so simple. 
pterosaurs, who we have talked about extensively in the past, the flying reptiles of the Mesozoic that weren't birds, your pteranodons and your rampharynchuses and your dimorphodons and stuff. Pterosaurs are not dinosaurs. Mm -mm. They are a related group to dinosaurs. Together they form a group, or Nithodira, I think, is the group with pterosaurs and dinosaurs together. Pterosaurs are known from many fossils to have been covered in what are called pycnofibers, which are hair-like filaments. These have been found on the head and bodies of several uh, groups of pterosaurs. There has been debate in the past over exactly what these structures are, but these are generally accepted these days to be integument, mm -hmm. a hair-like covering. Now, once again, there has been debate. It seems perfectly reasonable to suspect that pterosaurs, this other branch of Archosaur family tree, could have developed an independent hair-like structure. Many pycnofibers are simple monofilaments, right? One, one strand. However... There have been some very recent studies that have found peculiar aspects of pycnofibers. In a couple of pterosaurs, researchers have identified what appear to be tufts of filaments, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and in some cases, what appears to even be branches coming off of the central filament. That's pretty feathery. It's a lot like feathers. <laughs> there was also another, at least one other study that looked at the pigments in pycnofibers and found that they have a very similar diversity of pigments and arrangement of pigments as bird feathers. Okay. Yeah. Which is interesting on the one hand because it suggests that these might have been display structures, that they may have been colorful or camouflaged or something. These could also very easily have been insulation, you know, the same thing we see uh, in birds and mammals. And it could also mean that these are feathers. Yes. Uh, there are some researchers now, like in very recent studies in the last few years, that will just in their papers call them feathers. Yep. Did not even distinguish and just say pterosaur feathers. If these are feathers, if these are truly the same structure as feathers, this suggests that the origin of feathers is in the common ancestor of dinosaurs and pterosaurs, which means that fuzz was present before dinosaurs. Yep. We are on the cut. Remember in 1996 when we were like, wow, feathers aren't just a bird thing. Th Some dinosaurs had feathers. We are, we are teetering on the cusp of feathers aren't even a dinosaur thing. Yeah. They are a thing from early archosaurs, the early Triassic reptiles before true dinosaurs and pterosaurs, if these are homologous structures, may have had early versions of filaments and tufts that would later become familiar feathers. This raises all sorts of questions about <laughs> which of these early archosaurs would have had feathers. You know who else is in archosaurs very closely related to pterosaurs and dinosaurs? Crocs. Yep. Did the earliest crocs have fuzz? Yeah. Are or, modern crocs animals that have lost their ancestral fibers? Are all our crocs bald? Are they? Are all, are all of our crocs are naked? <laughs> uh, some researchers like to point out that if this is the case, if feathers are ancestral to dinosaurs, ancestral to pterosaurs, potentially even ancestral to both of them, that would put the origin of this fuzziness around the same time that we see the origin of other traits associated with warm-bloodedness. Potentially. Head on back to our thermoregulation episode, 179. There's been some back and forth about where exactly we see those evidences. But if that's the case, it could very well be that these are filaments and fuzz that showed up along with higher body temperatures and higher metabolisms in these early archosaurs. Yeah. So... Where we stand now, Coelurosaur dinosaurs have feathers. Within them, there are birds. Birds have feathers. We're very happy with the state of birds. Birds are, have all the feathers you expect them to have. We're pretty confident. We're pretty confident <laughs> that birds have feathers. We're pretty good on that. Coelurosaurs, feathers. It's possible some other theropods had fuzz. It's possible fuzzy things originated multiple times in dinosaurs or that all dinosaurs are ancestrally fuzzy. Pterosaurs also have fuzz, which may or may not 
also be feathers, and if they are, then archosaurs are mostly feathered animals. Yeah. Going back to before the origins of dinosaurs. This is where we are right now with feathers. It is an incredibly exciting time in the study of dinosaur and archosaur and feather evolution because it is fully possible that in the next few years we will find earlier dinosaurs with feathery structures or early basal crocs yeah. with feathery structures. It, there's there there's a ton of open possibilities that we don't know what we're going to get next. Well, and it, it also brings up the question of like, does that mean croc ancestors were feathery or was that one of the things that defined the split between those two halves of archosaurs? Right. Like nowadays we tell those apart mostly based off of like hips. The hips is a big, big defining part of those two sides of archosaurs. Mm -hmm. But if we were able to go back and see them alive, maybe it would have been super easy. It's like, no, yeah. the scaly half and the feathery half. Yeah. There's the fuzzy ones and there's the non-fuzzy archosaurs. And that basically gives you a pretty good tell as to which side of the family tree they're on. Yes. What's also exciting is that even if they're not the same structure, if they're not, that means that multiple groups of dinosaurs and pterosaurs independently evolved fuzz, which still leaves open the question of whether or not early crocs evolved fuzz. Yeah, exactly. That, like, archosaurs are just really good at yes. evolving fuzzy structures. What I like about this is that either way, whether these are shared ancestral features or whether they're independently evolved, either way, any dinosaur might have been fuzzy. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't actually change because it means that every dinosaur either was descended from fuzzy ancestors mm -hmm. or is part of a group that often develops fuzz. Yeah, that could have developed it on its own as well. <laughs> it also means that we are for sure bound to continue to find tons of different dinosaurs with feathers on them and feather-like structures. Well, the other thought that I've had during this of like, you know, between picno fibers and proto feathers and true feathers is that you also run into a situation that we talk about with, with evolution very often of like, if we go far, if we find, you know, a skin impression to far enough back and they've got quilly things or like little single, but very short, where do we draw the line on calling it a feather, you know, has, has right a single structure become multiple ones or are they, are we seeing different phases of the ancestral one? Yeah, it's it's it. Did this come from a previous structure? You know, are we going mm -hmm. to finally go back far enough and go? Oh, actually, it did come from a, a a kind of scale we were unaware of. Right. Or and and if that's the case, do we go back far enough and go? Hey, these little bristles seem to be a common ancestor of both hair and feathers. Yeah, exactly. That hair is actually also feathers. Yeah, like. The, s is there some pre precursor structure that makes it really easy for these integument to evolve? Absolutely. Yeah, it, it, it is. It's a, as you said, with modern birds, feather and scales, it's a complicated relationship when it comes to these kinds of structures. Yes. And now we're dealing with a situation where we have to hope these even preserve and then that we can identify them correctly. Yep. Thank goodness for Lagerstätte. Oh, yes. They are so good. <laughs> Excellent preservation fossil sites. Uh, this is one of the, like, in the last 30 years, some five dozen species of non-bird dinosaurs have been discovered with direct evidence of feathers or potential feather-like structures. This is just going to keep yeah. happening. Yeah. As a kid, I was under the impression of there's at least one or two feathery dinosaur-like things right. that confirm birds are indeed dinosaurs. Yeah, how exciting. For sure. And now we're at the point of, boy, there was a lot of fuzzy things back then. <laughs> yep, yeah. If we do episode 283 on yeah. feathers, it'll be a different discussion. Absolutely. We will have more feather structures. Who knows what pterosaurs are going to turn up? Mm -hmm. Who knows? Whoever knows what pterosaurs are going to yeah, turn up? Seriously. <laughs> it's such a cool topic. Uh, this has been a ton of fun to dive into. Feathers, like I said at the top of the episode, this is a subject I was excited to get into, and I was excited to go on the, a bit more detail and a little bit more nuance. This has been a long discussion because not only does this come up on the podcast a bunch, these questions about feathers, we mention feather diversity in the past a lot. We've also had a bunch of our listeners ask us about feathers. 
we had all our requesters who requested this topic, but we've also gotten people. We had a patron question not too long ago about this. People are really curious about this question. And I think part of why it's curious is because there's so much discussion about it in the news, in scientific papers these days, that it can be really hard to sort out what the status quo is now. Yes. How many of these have we found? Are all dinosaurs feathered now? Does T-Rex have feathers? Does it not have? I keep seeing things that go back and forth because this is in a state of continuous discussion, continuous discovery. And so all of the possibilities regularly make it into headlines and online discussions and our discussions on the podcast. So this has been a really good opportunity to sort of lay out, here's the overview of what the situation is. Uh, it fully in the knowledge that probably by the end of the year, it will be different again because well, it, it, it keeps happening. And as you were laying out with like, if these dinosaur feathers are truly feathers, that pushes it, the origin back from this group of dinosaurs to the beginning of dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. and that's the situation we're dealing with because of the examples we have. Any new specimen we find feathers could potentially be shifting that by millions of years of evolution not just a couple of branches on the dinosaur tree right. of like, well, maybe it's this, not this group, but their neighbor. No, we could be jumping orders and major groups. Right now, the origin of feathers, we are pretty confident, is somewhere between the ancestor of these nine closely related theropod families and the ancestors of archosaurs. Yeah. So... Somewhere in there. <laughs> Hopefully this, we'll narrow it down. All of this is to say, uh, paleo artists, you have my permission to put as much or as little feathers as you want on any dinosaur that Agreed. you see. J throw feathers on everything. Absolutely. Put fuzz on stuff. Agreed. <laughs> Uh, this has been a ton of fun. Uh, for sure, we will talk more about feathers uh, in the future. Uh, uh, there will probably be news about feathers before the year is out. But let's stop. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about other stuff. Before we wrap up the episode completely, there is one more thing for us to do, and that is our patron question. One of the benefits that patrons can get by being members of our Patreon is the opportunity to submit questions that we will answer here on the podcast Will, what is our patron question today? Our question is from Kathan, who asks, Are there any living species which are thought to be in an intermediate phase of evolving from one way of life to another? For example, could mudskippers be on their way to being fully terrestrial millions of years from now? In other words, are there any known living transitional organisms? This is a very interesting question. Absolutely. Uh, also a pretty fitting question for an episode like this, talking about so much evolutionary transition. Uh, the short and disappointing answer is, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, the, the concept of a transitional organism is one of these very odd and sometimes misleading concepts because it implies a direction. Yes. That you started at point A and started and end at point B, and a transition is in between. And because evolution doesn't have goals, right? The ev evolution is respond. It's reactive. It's not proactive. It means that we can only really know point A and point B in hindsight. Exactly. We look at the fossil record and we go, okay, this is where they started. And this is where they happened to end up. Here are some fossils that have intermediate stages between what it was and what it ended up being. So when we look at modern organisms, it's interesting because mudskippers absolutely could thousands, millions of years from now, give rise to more terrestrial descendants. Yes. They could also give rise to more aquatic descendants. Yeah, they could turn around and just go back into the water. They could also give rise to just more mudskippers yeah. that are just basically sticking around and doing the same thing. They could also go extinct. <laughs> like, <laughs> it is difficult, not basically impossible to say... This these organisms are going to transition millions of years from now into this other lifestyle. Yeah, we we don't have that level of predictability with evolution yeah. to be able to look at what an organism is doing now. And even if we're able to look at what their ancestors were doing to see that, you know, like the mudskippers, that their ancestors were more aquatic mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. and they are more terrestrial, that does not guarantee that that trend will continue. Yes. So just because the slope of the line is consistent up to where we are now. Right. This could be where it changes. It, yeah, it could absolutely dip and they could just, st- or plateau, you know, mm-hmm. stay where they are or start swimming again because that environment they're in now no longer is is supportive for some reason. Now, that being said, there are tons of animals today and other organisms today that are proxies for transitional organisms. Yes. So one of the, the big troubles with the idea of the transition is every step along an evolutionary path has to be viable, mm-hmm. right? You can't have half of a wing. You have to have arms covered in feathers that are kind of aerodynamic because you're using them for balance or running. And then eventually that might give rise to more aerodynamic flight capable feathers. So when we are curious about how did fish give rise to land dwelling tetrapods, animals like mudskippers are very helpful for us because whatever direction they're headed right now, they occupy the same niche that the intermediate phases of early tetrapods once probably occupied. So they're having to solve the same problems and the, overcome the same barriers that our ancestors would have. Yes. So we don't know if mudskippers are headed in the direction of more being more terrestrial, but we do know that they are semi-terrestrial, and therefore we can say, well, at some point our tetrapod ancestors were semi-terrestrial, Here's a group of animals that might give us some insights into what they look like. Yes. They're an analog for those ancient transitions. Uh, The same way that when we're looking at the origins of bird-like feathers, we will look at flightless birds today or baby birds. Flightless birds aren't necessarily going to then become flighted birds. And we have to keep that in mind. They are descended from flighted birds, Mm -hmm. not the other way around, but they might be a good comparison. Baby birds are a great example because baby birds are actually literally transition, yes. transitional because we do know where they're going. They are going to become birds, but that's not an evolutionary process. That's an ontogenetic process, which is different. So we can use these to sort of make comparisons. Yes. So because we don't know where any organisms are headed in the future, but because we do know that unless something bad happens, they are all headed somewhere in the future... It means that the question of whether or not there are any living transitional organisms is both no and yes, all of them. Yep. <laughs> Technically, everything is in some sort of transition to something potentially in the future. And like for the example, uh, uh, Kathan gave like from one way of life to another, like mm-hmm. two distinct phases of being. For sure, there are organisms on our planet that are in transition to that. We just can't identify them. Right. 10 million years from now, if we looked back, we might be able to go, oh yeah, vampire bats, as it turned out, were on their way to being terrestrial. Absolutely. Like fully flightless. Yes. That's where they ended up. Yeah. But right now, we don't know if that's actually going to happen. So there's de- that is definitely happening. There are definitely organism- organisms right now that we will point to as the middle phase, mm-hmm. but we can't do that until we see where they end up. Yes. Which which makes it a weird thing of, yes, but who knows <laughs> which ones. Yes. I guess there is a, a, a point to be made that we have seen minor transitions mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, with organisms changing some of their habits or some of their behaviors on a sort of smaller scale that we have observed over generations. Yeah. We, and we've talked about some of those in the news. And there's definitely groups that, like, if you had to bet, you know, like mudskippers... Right. like vampire bats, where we can already see that there's been a trend of transition from one habitat or lifestyle to mm-hmm. potentially at least closer to another. So, like, those are definitely hot, good betting options. Yeah, good candidates for it. But there's no guarantee. You know, they're more likely than being like, so how long is it going to take the whales to come back to land? Right. Like, that's a long shot. Right. <laughs> you can bet on that if you want. And who knows? Evolution's crazy. Listen, the odds are, are great if you win. <laughs> yes. But that there are definitely groups that are more or less likely to end up being those transitional members. But we can't guarantee on any of them. Yes. Cool question. 
Uh, very cool question. Very intriguing thing to think about. And one of those things that we we often encounter in paleontology. This came up with extinction, yes. uh, I think, in the end of the year Q&A, actually. The question of whether or not we could properly recognize a mass extinction during it. Mm-hmm. Or if we have to. There are some things in, that we deal with in paleontology that we really can only identify from the future. Yes. Very interesting to think about. Uh, And always important to remember the limitations of what we can do in our chosen science. Well, I I feel it's very similar to interpreting human history, that often it's very hard to tell why things are exactly the way they are while you're living it. But then historians can look back and go, oh, I can connect the dots as to how world events stumbled out to that unusual point in history. Right. Which is why uh, times of turmoil are so scary yes because <laughs> you're like is this is this world war three yeah or is this the fall of a great uh nation is that or is it just gonna be fine is yeah, it yeah. just gonna be fine in a year is this just gonna be a part of a chapter <laughs> <laughs> right we don't we don't know uh. nope thank you kathan for that thought-provoking question very fun thank you to all of our patrons uh who support us on the podcast if you're not a patron please consider joining the patreon thank you to those who requested this particular topic be sure to check out the blog post after this episode. Hop down to the episode description where there will be a link to our website. The blog post will have additional links for information, images of some of the things we've been talking about. Uh, also, I'll see if maybe I can get some uh, video links to go in there for things like the stridulating birds. <laughs> Don't forget that we are coming up on our anniversary live stream January 28th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Here in the United States, we will be having a public live stream. Anybody can join. Look to our social media and our website for the link and info for that. Come and join us. We're going to do some Q&A. You can ask us questions and chat with us. We'll announce some stuff that's upcoming, and we'll be doing our Patreon giveaway. Uh, And just generally celebrating our seventh year of uh, doing the podcast. So please join us for that. Special thanks here at the end of the episode to our top tier patrons, Danielle the Bug Lover, Sarah May, Robert Mart, Kit Kat Kacha, and Quinn Ferguson. This has been an awesome episode. I've had a ton of fun. We release episodes every fortnight, every two weeks, new episode. Sometimes there's even bonus stuff in between. If you've requested episode topics in the past, who knows? Maybe the next one will be yours. And if you haven't, uh, we got a, we've got a form on our website now where you can submit your episode requests. Yeah. Uh, so you should totally do that. Also, we're on social media. Also, we're on Discord. We've had Discord. Our Discord recently uh, hit 700 members. Which is so awesome. Which is pretty dang cool. We do uh, live Q&As on Discord every month. So there's all sorts of ways to engage with us. Uh, I am in, when I do, this doesn't always happen to me with podcast episodes. This happens to me with tours Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. at the museum where I will finish a tour, but still be in tour guide talking mode. Yep. Yep. And I'll like walk into a room and go talk to like my coworkers and I'll be talking way too loud because I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm still in the, (laughs) right now I'm still in podcast. I'm in recording talking about feathers mode. (laughs) Feathers are pretty awesome. Yeah, no, that I learned more than I thought I was going to learn. Same. During this episode, which is thought always I, a delight. thought I knew feathers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, dear listeners, uh, tell us what you learned in this episode that blew. I love learning. I like getting to blow Will's mind with information that I bring up in an episode. Uh, listeners, let us know if we blew your mind with any of our cool info about feathers. Uh, insert some sort of feather pun here. Yeah, now I've been trying to think of them throughout, and I've not, I've just not been landing on any great ones. You know, they tickle your fancy, something sure. like that. Sure, that's the you've 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 gotten the down low. Yeah, I try to think of something with flocking together with how many requests we had mm. for it. Sure, sure, sure. You know, listeners oh. of a feather flock together. Hopefully, we didn't do all this work in vain. Yeah, and yeah. people are people are listening to it. Yeah, uh, that was a bad pun, uh, and I'm sure some of our listeners bristled at it. <laughs> <sighs> all right time for us to stop making such a ruckus and... <laughs> all right that's it end it cut it <laughs> no good that's it we gotta cut it cut it before that one we've gotten too far start the outro music
Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.